Welcome back to week number two. It's our final week of a collection of talks on the Psalms of Ascent. We're here today. It's another beautiful day in the Blue Ridge Mountains. We're here at the bottom at the trailhead of the Humpback Rock Trail. We've got about a mile hike up to the top. The sign behind us is saying about a 40 minute trek and ascent up to the top. And so we're going to be doing that today as we look at the Psalms of Ascent. What are the Psalms of Ascent? Well, the whole book of Psalms is a book of songs. It's a book of songs and prayers that were sang to God, that were prayed to God out of many different emotions, many different feelings, many different life situations from the authors. And the Psalms of Ascent is a group of 15 Psalms, Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And this group of songs is almost like a road trip playlist. See, back in the day, the Jewish people, they would ascend to the holy city of Jerusalem. They would come from all over and from wherever they were coming from, they had to climb to get to the holy city. The holy city was, was put up onto a mountain. And so wherever they were coming from, they had to ascend up to the holy city to worship and to celebrate their God. And the Psalms of Ascent was their road trip playlist. These were the songs that they sang on their trek up the mountain. These songs reminded them of who God was. They reminded them of what God had done for them, of his past faithfulness, and really fixed their eyes and postured their heart towards who God was to prepare them to worship him in Jerusalem. They would scale the mountains. They would face the harsh, cold nights, the hot days. They would face the rough terrain to worship our God. And so we've been asking the question, where are we climbing? Where are we trekking to? Are we aiming? Are we moving towards God? What are we willing to face? What are me and you willing to scale? What mountains are we willing to climb to get to God? And finally, what's our song along the way? What's the posture of our heart as we seek God, as we ascend to know Him more? Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 130. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to take it out. We've got our watch getting ready to get started here. Let's climb. Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than a watchman waits for the morning, more than a watchman waits for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. The psalmist starts out in Psalm 130 by saying this. It's a cry. It's a cry from a desperate place. He says, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. He's crying out from the depths. It's almost creating a picture with words of, of being overcome, of like drowning in water, being up to your neck in the depths. I was even thinking about this. My brother, Andy here. 
just a few years ago, he, he was in Australia when he first got there, uh, him and a buddy, it was obviously their first time to this beach and uh, to this area, and they go out and they didn't know they were out at the wrong spot with the wrong current and all that kind of stuff. So they get out and get carried out and have to get rescued by some lifeguards. He's actually featured on a lifeguard reality TV show in Australia called Bondi Beach. <laughs> And uh, you should go watch it on YouTube, Bondi Beach. Andrew's there getting rescued. But the you know the whole video, it's 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 he's he's in over his head. He needs help. He's in a desperate place. He's in a panicked place. He's crying out for help. But that's almost a picture that we see here in Psalm 30. He he's praying. He says, "From the depths, I'm crying out to you, God." I'm in a desperate place. I'm in a broken place. I need help. I need someone to come to my rescue. So he says, I'm crying out to God. And then in verse two, look at this. I love this. He says, Lord, hear my voice. Now that's an interesting prayer because a lot of times when we're talking to God, we're saying, Lord, answer my prayer. But notice he doesn't say, Lord, answer my prayer. He says, Lord, hear my prayer. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. A heard prayer is better than an answered prayer. Because how many know, me and you have had times in our life where we're asking God for something and we're asking God for answers. And in hindsight, we know, man, I'm really grateful God didn't answer that prayer. I'm really grateful that God knows more than I know and God sits higher than I sit and God's ways are better than my ways. I'm really glad God didn't answer my prayer. Praise God that he hasn't answered all of our prayers, but praise God that he hears our prayers. And I love this, he says, Lord, hear my prayer. Because what are we doing when we're asking God to hear our prayer? We're saying, Lord, you know my situation. Lord, you know my heart. Lord, you know my journey as I'm aiming towards you and ascending towards you. So Lord, hear my prayer. Lord, hear what I'm going through, hear the cry of my heart, and now do with it what you please. A heard prayer is always better than an answered prayer. All right, we're here at our last stop before we hit the top of the hike, the top of the trail and see the overlook here at Humpback Rock. Verse number three, the psalmist continues by saying this, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? He kind of goes into a mode of confession saying, hey, he's, he knows that he has sinned. And then he's asking the question, if God kept a record of our wrongs, who could stand before him? Like if, if all of my sins, all of your sins, every bad thing we've done, every bad thing we've thought, every bad motive we've had, if it was just put out on a list before everyone and put out on a list before God, who could stand? Like think about that. Everything you've done, every sin, like, like even all the people that we passed so far on the way of this hike that were like, you're almost there lies lies all the lies the lies that the sign told us at the bottom it was only a mile lies we've hiked over a mile <laughs> everything that you've done i've done every sin that we've committed if it was put before god who could stand and the obvious answer the clear answer to this question is nobody not me not you if our sins were put before god who could stand before him nobody but verse number four gives us some hope and injects hope into what God has done for us. He says this in verse number four, but with you, there is forgiveness. But with God, there's forgiveness. It just creates that picture of like, hey, I know I'm broken. I know I'm sinful, but I'm with Christ. I'm with God. God has got me and with him there is forgiveness. This is why this term even is used all throughout the scripture that when we put our faith in Jesus, we are hidden with Christ. If you're thankful to be with Christ, put that down in the comments below. Say, I'm thankful to be hidden with Christ because with Christ, there's forgiveness. So 
Me and you can't stand on our own. Me and you can't make our good outweigh our bad. But with him, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. And then he goes on in verse 5 to paint this picture. I love this. He says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. I put my hope in his word. And then he creates a word picture for us. He says in verse 6, I wait for the Lord like a watchman waiting for the morning. And he says it again to show emphasis and make sure we get it. He's like, I'm waiting for the Lord like a watchman waits for the morning. So but, but what is he talking about? What picture is he trying to paint here? Well, the cities and towns in that day, they were surrounded by walls. A wall around your city was a sign of strength, it was a sign of protection. It was a sign um, that you you were uh, you had something between you and your enemies that could that could help protect and bring safety to your town and to your people. And so the towns would have watchmen. What the watchmen would do is they would sit on the top of the wall and watch for enemies. They would watch for other people that would come to invade their city. Particularly, they would do this at night. So if you were a watchman, you worked the night shift. And your whole job, your whole duty was to sit on top of the wall and scope the landscape at night looking for anyone that might come to invade your town, invade the walls. And so the psalmist is giving this picture of saying, hey, like a watchman waits, I'm waiting for the Lord. Like he's waiting for the morning, I'm waiting for the Lord. I was thinking of this picture, if you were to talk to a watchman back in that day, if you were to talk to a watchman at the top of the wall at night, every single day for weeks and months and years, that's all he did, every single night waiting for people to come, and you were to ask the watchman, hey, <clears throat> how likely would you say it is that the sun comes up tonight? Like when you're watching on duty tonight, when, when night comes to end, how, how likely would you say, how much would you bet on the fact that the sun is going to come up? Seems like a silly question. Seems like an obvious question. But you've got watchmen that have been looking out overnight for days, weeks, months, years. And guess how many times the sun has come up when they've watched? 100%. 100%. Every single time they've watched, the sun has come up. Every single time they've been working, the sun has come up. And so here's, here's what they're saying. Hey, like I, like a watchman waits for the sun to come up, I'm waiting on the Lord's forgiveness. How sure am I that the Lord will forgive? As sure as the sun's going to come up. How confident can I be that with Christ, I've got forgiveness just as confident that the sun's coming up. Like a watchman waits with anticipation for the morning, I'm waiting for Christ. I'm putting my hope in Christ. Why? Because with him, we have forgiveness. Look, if you know that you've got forgiveness, but you're still in a night season, if, you're, if you know you've put your faith in Christ, but you're like a watchman waiting in the night, here's my hope and my encouragement to you. Keep waiting. Keep putting your trust in Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Keep your heart anchored to Him because as a watchman waits for the morning, so I wait for the Lord because with Him we have forgiveness. I know at night the sun's coming up and I know in my faith that I've got forgiveness with Christ. Hey, well, we've reached the top. We've reached the peak here at Humpback Rock. As you can see behind me, the scenery is beautiful. The hike was brutal, but the scenery is beautiful. So thanks for making the hike with us today. Um, I mean, you actually just sat at home and watched this, but that's cool too. Thanks for joining along. If you want to tell your friends you went on a hike today, go for it. Go for it. You got it. Psalm 130, as we talked about, it finishes up talking about the idea of redemption. The idea of redemption it says this in verse number eight to finish out the chapter. I'm sorry, verse number seven. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for the Lord is unfailing love. And with him, here's what we have with God, ready, is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel 
from all their sins. I love that we've seen kind of a journey here where they've prayed out of a desperate place. They've confessed, Lord, if we put our sins up next to you, we couldn't stand, but you forgive us. And then this song, this psalm closes out by saying, Lord, with you, there's redemption. So this idea of redemption, what, what does it mean? It's a word that simply means to, to pay for something, to buy it back. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us because of our sin. Jesus went to the cross to pay for it, to buy us back so that we could know him. The good news of Jesus is that my sins and your sin have not stopped us from relationship with God because Jesus has redeemed us. With God, there is redemption. You know, this concept of ascending on the mountain and, and climbing up in pursuit of God, what the Jewish people did to the Holy Land, and we've talked about this journey towards Christ. It can create a picture of us striving in us, trying to get to God. And, and I want to finish out our collection and finish out our talk today, making sure that we bring in the whole context of the good news of the gospel here when we talk about ascending towards God. See, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is beginning his public ministry and the first sermon that he preaches, it's his most famous sermon. Uh, it's the best sermon ever preached by God himself. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is on a mountain. He's, uh, he's on a, in a space like we are. He's elevated and he's teaching this sermon. And on that message, in that sermon, he, he lays out um, the new ways of the kingdom. And uh, what he does is he, he lays out things that are extremely hard to follow. He's looking at people and saying, uh, hey, you, you've heard it said that you shouldn't murder, but if you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. He, he says things like, you've heard it said you shouldn't commit adultery, but if you lust after someone, you've committed it in your heart. And so Jesus is raising the bar in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is taking what was already said and known, and he's raising it to a whole nother standard. There's one commentator, he talks about the Sermon on the Mount and the commands given and the instructions given. And he says this, it is impossible to overestimate the impossibility of the Sermon on the Mount. Meaning, me and you can look at the Sermon on the Mount and none of us can do it perfectly. None of us line up. None of us can take everything Jesus instructed and perfectly do it. And again, that ties us back to our previous thought. Lord, if we put all of our life and sins before you, who could stand? The answer is nobody. And that's what we get from the Sermon on the Mount too. It's something to strive for. It's something we should live for, but it's something that none of us can do. I can't do it perfectly and you can't do it perfectly. And so Jesus teaches this message and then he walks down the mountain. He descends the mountain in Matthew chapter eight. And as he's coming to the bottom of a mountain, something incredible happens. He runs into a guy who is a leper. This is a guy with the skin disease of leprosy. And in that day, in that culture, they were not allowed to go near someone because they were considered unclean. They were not allowed to touch someone or have human contact. They had to be quarantined. That's something that we've learned about in this season. If you had leprosy, you were quarantined. You couldn't go near anyone because if you touch someone, you would contaminate them. They were considered unclean. And Jesus finishes teaching the Sermon on the Mount, uh, full of, full of uh, raising the bar and high standards. And on his way down the mountain, he meets this leper. And in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus does something that's never been done in the history of humanity before. He reaches out to touch the leper, but instead of him getting contaminated, the scripture says that now this leper is healed. For the first time, someone that was clean touched someone that was unclean and clean one. What was Jesus doing here? What was the picture Jesus was painting? He just preached a sermon on a mountain and now he's coming down the mountain to touch someone who is sick. He's coming down the mountain to touch someone who society saw as a failure. What is Jesus doing? He's giving us a picture of the gospel. The gospel, not that we have to climb the mountain to get to God, but that God came down the mountain. God descended the mountain to come down to save us. So yes, we pursue God and yes, we go after God, but the good news of the gospel is in our failing attempts to get to God, we don't have to ascend the mountain, but Jesus through the cross and through the resurrection 
descended the mountain. Jesus left his throne in heaven to come down to earth to touch us, to forgive us, to save us and redeem us. This is the good news of the gospel. And so we learn from the Psalms of Ascent that we're going to pursue God and we're going to pursue his ways and we're going to go after him and we're going to have a song in our heart while we do it. But we also have the lens and the perspective of while we are trying to ascend and go after God, that God has descended. He came down from heaven to us to rescue us, to save us so that we might know him. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in with us today for The Ascent. We've scaled the mountains, we've hiked the trails, and we've walked through some of the Psalms of Ascent about worshiping God and pursuing God and being grateful for all that God is and all He's done. I hope you've been encouraged through this, and I hope you've seen Jesus just a little bit more clearly. And colors fly. There's no hiding from your grace. I can't deny your heart for mine And it's unrelenting chase I was on the edge of deception Caught up in my own hesitations Until your love took over me So I let go and I let love Show me life like it's supposed to be On No!